Are we gonna see a breathalyzer test for pot soon? Probably not. Breathalyzers at the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Let's start by talking about how breathalyzers work for alcohol. Most of the ones that cops use, and even the high-end consumer versions, use fuel cells. The sensors oxidize the alcohol in your breath and then run a current through the sample. The strength of the current is related to the amount of alcohol in your breath. The other type of breathalyzer uses a semiconductor oxide sensor. These are those smaller ones that you find commercially. They use a heated metal mesh inside the sensor. The alcohol in your breath changes the resistance of the metal mesh, and that can be used to calculate how much alcohol is there. There are also ways to measure the infrared spectrum of your breath, but those devices don't seem to be used much in the field. For all of these, the alcohol in your breath is assumed to be related to the alcohol in your blood, which tells the cops how drunk you are. Now, this relationship assumes that you've put no alcohol in your mouth for the last 15 or 20 minutes, because if you have, then the percent of alcohol in your breath will be much higher than what would be expected from your blood. People have come up with all kinds of ways to try and trick the breathalyzer. Some people say that if you've had too much to drink and you get pulled over, you should suck on a copper penny. The theory is that the copper in the penny will create a chemical reaction with the alcohol in your saliva, which results in an inaccurate breathalyzer reading. Ironically, even the idea of a copper penny is largely a myth, since for decades pennies have been made of zinc, but even the slight amount of copper in the penny doesn't influence the outcome of the test. A breathalyzer measures the blood alcohol content by examining the alcohol level of the air from deep within your lungs. The amount of alcohol in the air down there is actually very close to the amount of alcohol in your blood. Besides pennies, I've heard recommendations to suck on nickels, cough drops, peanuts, curry powder, onions, mouthwash, or breath mints. Mythbusters did a whole episode on this. They found that pennies, breath mints, and onions did nothing to decrease the blood alcohol reading from the breathalyzer, and that using mouthwash actually increased the alcohol reading for the breathalyzer. That's cause mouthwash contains alcohol, of course. It'd be like drinking right before the test. It won't help. There was even a case back in 2005 in Canada, and you can still find this news story, where a man tried to fool a breathalyzer by stuffing his mouth full of feces. This story's so good, I'm gonna tell it in its entirety. A 59-year-old man was pulled over and put into a cruiser to go back to the station to get tested. On the way, he vomited all over himself, urinated, and defecated in the car. Then he grabbed a handful and thought he'd trick the machine by putting it in his mouth. It didn't work. He had a reading more than twice the legal limit. Personally, I think putting your own feces in your mouth immediately proves you're drunk. Science won regardless. You should also know that a number of policies require two tests 15 to 20 minutes apart. So any effects you miraculously got from what you had in your mouth the first time would need to be repeated for the second test too. Even if you somehow managed to beat the system once, it's less likely that you'd be able to do so again. Careful studies of breath alcohol samples show that they are incredibly accurate and correlate very well with blood alcohol levels, which are unaffected by what you put in your mouth, even feces. Okay, so with that out of the way, on to pot. With it becoming legal in more and more states, there's some concern that driving under the influence of pot may become more common. There's no good way to tell if someone's been smoking pot recently, though. Some studies have shown that a fairly large percentage of drivers may have THC in their bloodstream when driving at night or on the weekends, but that doesn't mean they're high then. THC sticks around for a while in your body. Most of the blood tests we have don't even measure for THC. They measure metabolites, which don't cause impairment. They're just a marker for past use. That's great if you're doing a drug test for a job, but not so good to see if you're actively smoking when you get in the car. Some saliva tests can tell if someone has active THC in their system, but not how much. Such a test can tell if you use pot when you shouldn't have, but what we need to know here is if a driver is impaired. A lot of companies are trying to make a breath test though, because they see major dollars if they can. Some use a combination of optical scanning and chemical material science. But even those companies acknowledge there's a difference between the device's use in the controlled environment of the lab and the harsh reality of the real world. Do they know if it works in the rain? In the freezing cold? No. When you exhale alcohol, there's somewhere on the order of one molecule of alcohol for every thousand molecules in your breath. With pot, it's more like one in a trillion. That's much harder to detect, clearly. There's even a bigger problem, though. We have a wealth of data by which we all learned how to correlate the amount of alcohol in your blood and the amount of alcohol in your breath. 
We have literally almost no studies that quantify this for marijuana. Clearly, amounts in the breath will also vary by how the pot was ingested, like by smoking it or eating it. We also have no data on how levels of pot in the blood or breath correlate with actual impairment. Again, tons of data and legal studies for alcohol, testing how people drive at various levels of drinking. We have almost no studies at all for active uses of pot. Regardless, some companies are promising devices will be available this year to allow police to test for THC in your breath on the road. Until then, probably even after then, police will have to rely on tests of impairment, which don't care what you ate, drank, or smoked. They just test for how able you are to control yourself. Fail one of those, and you've got pot in your system, you could be in trouble. Hey, I've got a book coming out November 7th. It's called The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully, and it comes from a lot of the episodes you've loved here at Healthcare Triage. I'd really appreciate it if you pre-order a copy. Link's down below. Healthcare Triage is supported in part by viewers like you through Patreon, a subscription service that allows you to support the show through monthly donations. We'd especially like to thank some of our biggest helpers, including Sam, Joe Sevitz, and Joshua Crow. Thanks, guys. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash healthcaretriage. We'd also appreciate if you'd like the video and consider subscribing up there. It really helps.